We're going to talk about threat intelligence and the limits of malware analysis. But first, I do cyber threat intelligence for Dragos. So typically with a uh, industrial control system, critical infrastructure focus in what I do, somewhat relevant because I have a feeling that get, we start getting into topics. And I like to be very critical of what we do both as practitioners and within industry because it's the only way that we get better. So looking at what it is that, uh, you know, what methodologies we use, how we operate, and then trying to figure out, well, can we do things slightly differently or in a slightly more improved way? Because uh, one of the aspects of my background is that I am a, you know, as one might say, a recovering Catholic. I am, well, I am that, but I am also a recovering humanities graduate student. So I was a philosophy graduate student once upon a time. And one of the interesting things that I worked on, you know, doing deontological ethics and other fun things or whatever that'll put you to sleep later if you talk to me is, uh, you know, when we start thinking about things like the good or ethics or whatever, are there limitations in the methodologies that we use that even allow us to speak to or recognize what that subject is to begin with? And I think we can see parallels to that within our own field of cyber threat intelligence when we start looking at both the sources of some of the information that we use in our reporting and how we support customers and clients and whatnot, as well as the data from which that emerges um, ultimately and gives rise to such analysis. So our agenda for today is we'll talk about whether the goals of threat intelligence, because it's good to be all on the same page, so maybe my definitions are different than yours, you can yell at me later, uh, and then look at that in the context of malware analysis and where there might be limitations in some of these uh, ways of technical analysis and what that means to defenders, what that means for CTI, and what it is that as defenders and analysts we can do in order to uh, address any such limitations, problems, or concerns that we might have. So first, why threat intelligence? I mean, everyone's here for a threat intelligence summit. This should go without saying, I guess. But you know, threat intelligence allows us both to sort of detect and advance those things that we might not already know about or uh, you know, see the cyber intrusion or whatever inbound before it actually hits our networks, as well as facilitating deep dive investigation into things that have already happened into us by giving us insight into what an adversary does, how they operate, their behaviors and tendencies and whatnot. Uh, we've seen CTI evolve over time from the sharing of you know, simple atomic technical indicators, so you know, an IP address, a hash value, a file name, et cetera, to moving into an indicator of compromise, a actually you know, using the definition of an IOC, which means some level of enrichment and correlation with other events. And then more recently, we've seen greater emphasis on tracking actual adversary behaviors not just the single atomic incident of this type of malware or this type of network communication, but rather what is the overall uh, tendencies of an adversary? How do they act from one intrusion to another in ways that I can then map this out and reliably detect that moving forward, even if specific technical observables change from time to time? So that's really cool. We take lots of discrete events and observations and then cluster that into groups of activity and behaviors, which enables defense, like this is really good stuff. Because the goal of CTI is that we want to build understanding through observables and IOCs, then transition that data, that analysis, into more robust categorizations of behavior that then enable us to have sustainable defense that can keep up with adversaries over time instead of playing IP address whack-a-mole or blacklisting all of Iran because like every, you know, all internet traffic out of Iran must be bad and therefore now I am safe. Uh, it doesn't work that way, unfortunately. So we've talked a lot about CTI, and you know, that's the whole point of the conference or whatever, and we're really seeing this as sort of taking lots of uh, discrete data points and trying to make a bigger picture out of it, whether that's adversary behaviors, adversary clustering, in order to try and arrive at some type of attribution. Uh, what's malware analysis? Well, malware analysis can be, in many cases, that very focused deep dive into a single sample. You get those crazy people or whatever in darkened rooms in the gamer chair sit in front of Ida Pro for seven hours a day, and they reverse the custom encoding or encryption methodology or whatnot and come up with a really cool report. All right, that's all really well and good, but it's important to recognize that while you can have, and there's you know, lots of work both on the machine learning sort of front and automatic analysis and correlation of samples, as well as some you know, really interesting rock stars that can take 50, 100 samples and start clustering that together and analyzing each and every one of those in, a, uh, deep in, in IDA or heaven knows what else or whatever. But typically, we're talking about a per sample sort of analysis. Because really what we're looking for from a malware-specific standpoint is you know, getting an understanding of functionality and purpose, trying to get a, a uh, conception of the design and structure of a given sample, or are there things unusual about the way that the binary is structured, or that this document dropper is assembled, how are things actually functioning, and then to transition that into some me mechanism for designing signatures and detection. You know, I want to defeat this stuff because I think it's bad, 
and make sure I can do that reasonably reliably or whatever for any variance of that stuff. So our, one of our sources of malware data, and this has kind of come up, I think, in a few of the other talks today, is that you know, we have incidents and incident response data. Uh, be careful where you're getting some of that data, I guess, or what not, whatnot. But you know, what's important about those sorts of examples is that these are things that we're directly interacting with. This is an incident and event which we have exposure to that we not only have samples from, but we also have logs from. We also have uh, information about what the adversary did or was trying to do within that environment. We have enrichment around those technical samples themselves. We can also get samples that are shared, you know, tell a friend, tell a bro, whatever, uh, sharing floppy disks back in the day, now sending things through, you know, pick a chat application or whatever you like, or PGP signed emails, because we are technically literate enough to do that without failing all the time. Um, but one interesting thing about shared samples is that that still has some level of context as well, because at least we know where we're getting that sample from, that individual, you know, just by virtue of who had the sample and is sharing it, we can get some idea of what information might surround it. And we can also ask further questions of, well, where did this sample come from? What did it do? Tell me more about what you observed in the environment and whatnot. And lastly, we have third party sources in sample gathering. So virus total, malshare, any run, et cetera. These are really powerful sorts of tools that have enabled a, you know, almost a Copernican revolution in terms of the ability of analysts to get into samples they never otherwise would have had access to because it's completely outside of their environment, uh, allows them to query large data sets to look for similarities and similar items out there and really create interesting reports. The problem, though, is that when we start going down this route of using third party or commercially acquired databases in order to source samples, something gets lost in the in the transition. So what we observed in the first two instances where we have some contextuality, some background, or even just the ability to ask further questions of where we got something from, all gets lost because now I just have a sample that I pulled from virus total. So I guess show of hands, maybe like, you know, how many people here wish they had access to virus total that don't? It should be like a non-zero number or whatever. I'm sure there's a few, but you know, there's this idea that it's like, oh, I could be so awesome at what I do if only I had access to VTI, but it costs so damn much money, and I just hope someone puts this to Malshare so I can download it. And like, that's cool. And again, it does enable certain things, but you know, maybe we're looking at this a little bit the wrong way because while we have access to one certain type of data that enables a degree of analysis, it doesn't enable us to go all the way necessarily. Because when we start talking about intrusion events, when we start talking about security incidents that we're responding to and trying to build defenses for, there's lots of other data involved. So we have host data and tools, which includes malware, but also things like shell scripts, or host artifacts like log data, or how a system was manipulated in some way using legitimate tools in order to do something that you didn't want it to. We have network traffic analysis and protocol analysis. How did that malware communicate? How did someone take control actively of that uh, implant or whatever else is in the environment in order to achieve actions on objectives. And then, kind of murky, but it still is important sometimes, is that we have, well, it's important all the time, but we can't necessarily answer this question all the time, is adversary intent and purpose. Were they trying to wipe my environment? Are they trying to steal money from me? Are they trying to make me give money to them so I can unlock my machines? Because that all has repercussions both for what an adversary is capable of doing and willing to do in pursuit of those goals. Now, looking at all those sorts of uh, data points and observations that we need to get a real thorough understanding of a security incident, malware analysis really only gets us one. It gets us shadows cast upon the wall of things like intentionality, and you can certainly run a sample in an environment to see what sort of network traffic it might generate, but it's just for that one sample. You don't necessarily get the additional detail that might surround it in terms of what other tools are used in that environment, how it was part of an overall intrusion set, then unless you have that information for like, well, what's the dropper? What is the follow-on tool from this and how is it used? You might get some picture of these other items, but not the complete set, which leads to not necessarily subpar analysis, just incomplete analysis, where we might want to tell ourselves that, well, you know, binaries or packets or it didn't happen, like, well, that's true, but it's not necessarily getting us the complete picture of what it is we need to know to properly disposition and categorize an incident. Because what we're really looking at here when we're talking about just sourcing things as a single sample within isolation is that we're getting into that typical, you know, how many guys in an elephant and trying to figure out what the hell this thing looks, looks like because we're blind. Uh, and it's important to note that I'm focusing on malware analysis here. This applies to any other sort of discipline within threat intelligence as well. We saw this just a couple of weeks ago where some interesting individuals published a report about, oh my goodness, the Russians are hacking the Ukrainians again. Uh, and did so off of a very, very slim sort of attribution based upon network observables. You know, looking at that report that was published out based upon a very narrow scope of the observed activity with nothing else really to back it up, we had a rather shocking or certainly a very important claim made that was not necessarily justified. 
So this is something that we can fall into a trap in multiple disciplines, but it's important to note that at least it seems with the evolution of CTI over time, with the availability of tools like VirusTotal and other sharing services, that malware analysis seems to be the one that continues to come up as being maybe not necessarily problematic, but at least leading to interesting sorts of situations that need to be analyzed perhaps just a bit further. Because the limitations that we see is that malware analysis is just one part of the picture. An overemphasis on technical binary analysis can produce good results for that binary, but skewed conceptions for what an overall event means or what its implications might be. Because context, purpose, and overall function within the entire scope of the intrusion are critical to understanding what's actually going on and to provide defenders with complete advice for how to you know, get after or defeat some sort of adversary that's out there. Because when we have this skewed perspective, what results is that we might have very excellent detections or defenses for a very narrow portion of what happened within an environment or what an adversary could do later on, but we're missing, as a result of focusing on that single tree, the overall forest of both initial intrusion vectors, follow-on mechanisms after a tool is run, what the purpose of using that tool is, and where in the environment it might uh, be designed to interact with. And so we get a less effective defense. You know, you could map this to things like kill chains, attack, you can take your choice, I don't care. Uh, I have to say attack, otherwise Katie will tackle me. Well, I guess maybe not anymore. Uh, someone will tackle me. But um, you know, there are ways of trying to articulate this in such a way that we get a greater grasp of the overall environment, but it's important not to look at a single isolated tool unless you have something that is you know, basically packaging up all functionality in itself and stands on its own, like Stuxnet, I didn't mention it first today. Um, you know, short of such examples like that that provide us with the silver bullet of everything is packaged into one single sample, typically we're going to need other data points in order to adequately disposition and categorize what's going on instead of just saying, I have a remote access tool or I have a back door. It seems like I always talk about 2016 Ukraine because I spent way too much time on this event. So we're going to talk about that because I think there are some lessons to be learned where malware analysis did some things or led to some conclusions that then had Implica real implications for defenders, but then look at more general actor linking on tools, since this is something that we all kind of do, and what the consequences and what the implications are of some of the methodologies there. And then look at a campaign that was uh, just, well, more than a couple of months ago now, over the summer of 2019, called Look Back and its relationship to the group called APT10. It was interesting to look at this because at the time of initial release, really the only data or the initial in-depth release going to, oh my goodness now, summer of 2017, Seems like it was a decade ago, but um, you know, lots of analysis on malware. We had a set of samples, we had a dropper, we had some other tools or whatever, and looking at isolation, it was very easy to tell a story that, okay, we had this tool that worked as a backdoor that then seems connected to these industrial control specific related tools or whatever, so you use the backdoor to fire off these other tools and then bad stuff happens, and then based upon some technical analysis of that tool chain, I can get some idea for both attribution and defense. This comes back to the in-destroyer backdoor, to use ESET's terminology for this, uh, you know, fairly, it's a backdoor, it does backdoory things. Uh, you know, not a whole lot else to be said for that other than it's customized until uh, on a variation of that backdoor that they were able to use other telemetry, important point there, is that was using enriched data, presumably from some telemetry as part of their antivirus service in order to link a new variant of that backdoor called XRML, I think I'm pronouncing that right, to an entity they call Telebots, which most of us refer to as Sandworm. What was interesting about this is that we see that backdoor connection which the analysis here is very good. Like I have no, you know, there's no criticism of that whatsoever. Like this is really good work. And identifying how the 2016 Ukraine power event backdoor linked to subsequent sandworm activity, and then all of a sudden we're looking at a picture of like, well, then everything is sandworm, right? Well, it didn't quite work out that way though, because the lack of enriched data in the initial analysis of the event focusing only on the malware that was identified or allegedly identified within the Ukrainian network uh, masked that there was actually something else going on in the network at the same time. So there, there was this backdoor module within the network that looks very similar to sandworm activity and seems tied very closely to initial intrusion and propagation within the network. But if you start looking at things like host and network logs within that network as well, outside of just the malware, an interesting different picture emerges where we see an initial intrusion stage that uses sandworm-like techniques and tooling and then a follow-on intrusion stage that uses completely different sets of behaviors using living off the land techniques, uh, past, uh, credential capture and reuse in order to propagate into the control system environment, and then distributing the actual ICS attack payload. So it looks, for all intents, that there are two groups in involved in this environment, or one group with a substantial change in methodology about halfway through the intrusion. 
What's also important about that is that if you only looked at this from a malware perspective, you would have an idea of how to defend this and detect it, but completely missing then a lot of the sort of, you know, seems very fundamental basic network security hygiene from an IT perspective, but in a control system environment, this shit is like, you know, fucking magic. Excuse my language. But, uh, you know, doing things like better host-based logging, identifying credential reuse and remote authentication activity from the network. An entire class of how this intrusion played out that would be vital for any entity to, or to know about to defend themselves adequately that got lost initially. So again, it's not that the analysis was bad, but it's just for lack of additional information until much later on, we had a vision of this attack that obscured or completely missed very important aspects of this that resulted in a substandard defense to a replay of this sort of attack. This kind of links us into, since we talked about a little bit of attribution there, of linking actors based on tools. We do this all the time. We come up with very large clusters of activity like Sandworm, like Animal Farm, like Equation Group, et cetera, based upon seeing samples over time that have sort of overlapping technical details and then that attribution by, uh, bleeds over as you see certain snippets of code reused over time into different samples, and so you have an activity like Sandworm that covers a plethora of different attacks, techniques, droppers, et cetera, over time, and if you look at where they stand now, it looks really different from where they started off. You could look at this as attribution, or you could look at it as potentially, like we see with groups like Lazarus, the accretion of maybe one too many detail over time that results in a muddied picture. You know, and maybe this is a little bit of mirror imaging because I do have a US government background, but. APTs are not necessarily standalone actors, but especially when we start talking about state-based entities and even criminal-based entities like we saw in the previous talk with you know, ideas of buying tooling or using dark web markets or whatever to acquire stuff, is that APTs kind of have a structure, that you have some, someone calling the shots, someone determining what the goal is, make money, steal secrets, blow stuff up, et cetera. And then you have operations teams, but between them are sitting who's actually developing the tools. Like I, give all credit in the world to APT29 and uh, uh, Pick a Kitten, I don't know, any of those sorts of entities out there. Uh, you know, I'm sure they're very technically competent people, but I'm pretty sure they're also not spending a lot of their time doing their own development work. And in fact, we also see not just having externally develop, uh, external development teams or support teams, but people buy crap off the market or hire contractors too. I mean, we're sitting in Crystal City. Contractors do this kind of crap all the time. We can see tool continuity continue over time, almost like a Voltron put together things or whatever as they fit different sort of mission profiles or different expectations. But that can span different development actors. I'm taking this library from the private stash here or whatever and combining it with this other custom code base to produce something for this operations team who is responsible to this planning actor who focuses only on Middle Eastern financial operations or European strategic communication and defense operations, et cetera. So we get really interesting combinations of activity when we start talking about APTs or threat groups as being non-monolithic entities that can sort of borrow, plug in, or use different tools coming from different sources, whether that's from dedicated development teams, which probably happens sometimes, but also development teams that support multiple entities or buying things off the commercial market, let alone pulling things right off of GitHub. We also see that contractor and vendor approach, whether you're talking about really shady entities like NSO Group and Hacking Team, uh, dark matter, and uh, you know entities that we would consider pretty much above board, like a Raytheon or Booz Allen or something along those lines, Lockheed Martin, that support, say, the Department of Defense. They're contracting out work for NSA, DOD, IC, et cetera, or whatever, and so you could have the same programmer theoretically supporting dramatically different goals, dramatically different entities, even if it's overall responding to the same sort of national command authority at the end of the day, which produces a really interesting picture when you're analysis focus is going to be solely on the tool that they developed without necessarily knowing who was on keyboard or who was the person giving orders for the execution of that tool in the environment. You can do an actor link on a tool, like, you know, if it looks like a duck, talks like a duck, walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, etc. Yeah, you, you found another duck, maybe not necessarily the same duck. So, you know, having that mindfulness that these don't necessarily always equate one-to-one -one from tool to actor is really important in trying to tie together a bigger picture. This is a real favorite of mine, I'm still digging into this one, and I'm using this as a good example because Proofpoint reported on this in uh, this past summer on phishing activity targeting the U.S. electric sector. What was really interesting about it, though, is that it looked really like APT10-like activity. So, macro-enabled document with specific functionality inside of it to drop a dorked or modified version of the GUP EXE uh, update service associated with Notepad++, and then using a malicious modified libcurl.dll with one dirty ex uh, export in it to serve as the callout back to the uh, adversary infrastructure. Like, oh, this is really cool. It also sounded really familiar because with just a little bit of Google searching and the uh, reporting team linked to this, 
is that it, it is exactly like something that FireEye reported on about a year earlier with APT10 operations in Japan. I mean, I'm not just talking like inspired by, but almost word for word, the exact same activity, the exact same use of tools, the exact same uh, use of that libcurl DLL loader, et cetera. Then if we start looking at this a little bit further, it's like, well, that almost looks like too close. Maybe there's something else going on. Like, well, wait a minute. I remember about a year prior to this, we saw some phishing activity in the US electric sector that was linked to DPRK with a document dropper that had some similarities, at least with the overall Lazarus set, with how the document dropper used in the look back campaign was put together. We've got that similarity in targeting. We've got this, like, it's kind of weird for Chinese espionage actors to be in critical infrastructure, and that's some mirror imaging that you should avoid, but hey, whatever, we'll go there right now. That there's lots of weird stuff going on here, so maybe this is someone else just trying really hard to look like another entity by building off of a publicly available threat intelligence report to structure their campaign identically. A malware-centric approach doesn't allow us to answer any of these questions. Because the look back malware and dropper analysis, like the first thing is like, oh, it's APT10. It's like, well, wait a minute. It looks way too much like APT10. That doesn't make any damn sense at all. False flag. There might be some DPRK overlap here. It's the Koreans trying to look like the Chinese who maybe are actually the Russians who are looking like the Venezuelans or something. But maybe that's what the adversary wants to think. And we can crawl into our own heads about this based upon very limited data. And I think Proof Point did an excellent idea in their blog post on this by noting that yes, there are these connections, but based upon the available information, just a couple of dropper samples and the resulting malware, the conclusion is indeterminate. That's a very good thing to do. It's a very good pause to take in our analysis because it would be very easy to make an analytical jump that would allow us to say like, oh, like either this is like, you know, Olympic destroyer redux, like who knows who the hell did it or whatever, or this is getting into the territory of, you know, someone really trying to mess with the analyst or whatever. But because we lack the contextual information around both additional samples, how these operated in the environment, greater understanding of what the infrastructure that was backing this up, how that was created, how it came into play outside of maybe a couple of domains that were identified, we can't make those calls. And it's important to understand and admit that we can't make those calls so that we don't end up putting ourselves in a bad position later on in terms of analysis. And where do we go from here now? Yes, I reused that slide because no one got that joke last time either except for Amy, and Amy got it again. Malware analysis definitely has value. Every report that I referenced today is a good report and it rep represents good malware analysis. The only thing is we have to understand that it only represents one element of security event analysis and could lead, if done in isolation without paying attention to other things that are going on, lead to skewed analysis that results in either indicating relationships that exist that really aren't there, strengthening potential relationships that are actually much weaker, like again, that shared tool developer or someone got a new job, you know, worked from, started off north of DC and migrated to south of DC and they took their code base with them, which you shouldn't do, but you know, I imagine it happens. Um, you know, that these sorts of things come up. It's an important tool to use within our analysis, but if it's the only tool, we have to understand that it represents or imposes limitations on what conclusions we can draw and the strength of those conclusions. Because what we really want to look for is some free range, holistic, uh, you know, non GMO sort of threat intelligence incorporating everything that we can possibly jam into event knowledge. So yes, malware, binaries, tools, et cetera. Very important, critical even, in order to get an understanding for how an actor is going to operate. But we only get an understanding of one part of an incident or one element of it if we don't also put in logs, artifacts, network traffic data, and then to the extent that we can, what sort of intentions, purposes, or objectives were in play to try and differentiate. You know, and a good example here is NotPetya. Looking at that as a ransomware initially, like, okay, that gives us one idea of what was going on, but then a further understanding and deeper analysis on a tool level combined with where it was operating, what it did, of looking at it not just as an encryptor, but really as a subtly designed, maybe not too subtly, wiper, gives us a much different picture about what happened there. And you don't get that just by looking at the tool alone necessarily. You can get like a glimpse of it, but it's only by looking at how it interacted within the environments in question, what impacts it had, and how it functioned, and where it went, that you can start getting a better idea of like, well, wait a minute, this is something really serious and has some very interesting implications. Context is key. You want to try and get as much of a view of events as possible to try and draw up strong conclusions. This sounds like it should be like, of course, that's freaking obvious, Joe. Like, Sands invited you up here to tell me that. The thing is, it seems like we forget about it a lot, though, because you find something interesting in a data set like VirusTotal, or you find something sitting on an open FTP server on the internet, and you get really excited, like, oh, I found something really cool. Start digging in, analyzing it, ripping that binary apart, looking at what you found, and as a result of that excitement, as a result of that discovery, you can start making claims or start telling yourself a story that is far weaker than it seems in your mind after you spent 
20, 30, 40, et cetera, hours looking at that sample in isolation. From a threat intelligence perspective, we want to start building in the, con the idea of having confidence and, uh, you know, you can look at it as weasel language, I call it estimative language, <laughs> into what it is that we're telling customers, clients, defenders, et cetera. Because understanding is fundamentally based on data. The more and more varied data sources and varied data analysis techniques you throw at something, the stronger sort of conclusions you can draw because you're building a more complex picture of the event in question. If, and a lot of times we have to, rely on single source, single analysis type investigations, malware analysis on its own, pivoting off of domain infrastructure all on its own, we still can gain value. That's still valuable information. You can still enable defense that way, but be mindful of the fact that you've only been able to answer part of the question involved and can't necessarily get as deep or as far as you'd like to go. Make sure you remind yourself of that, but also make sure that your clients are aware of that as well so that you're not handing off something to them that sounds like it's ground truth sort of data when it's actually just based on reversing one sample in isolation with no contextuality for the environment in which it was found or how it was used. This slide deck will be available on the SANS website, uh, links to various reports and whatnot that I referenced in here as well as some other reading. Uh, I actually wrote this up as a paper this year. Uh, because it's hard as hell to follow me on stage and whatnot. It's not available yet. It should be available on the Dragos website by the end of the week. If I can, when I get the link for that, I will try and work with Sans to get that link added to this as well if you'd like to read this instead of hearing me talk really, really fast. But YouTube does have a slowdown function. Mm -hmm.